Good afternoon. Today, I will introduce the multi-layered church sourcing approach, which is an innovative method to make stones talk. And of course, I'm speaking on behalf of the research team involved in these provenance studies here. Essentially, I will talk about raw material economy. One of the most suitable approaches to reconstruct resource management is the investigation of stone tools because they represent one of the most abundant find categories at prehistoric and mainly Stone Age sites. There exist different ways how prehistoric people obtained their lithic raw materials, the first being direct procurement, where the people went to the sources themselves, and depending on the distance from source to the site, these materials were brought back either as raw materials, as half-finished products, or as ready-made blanks. A second option is indirect procurement through exchange networks with groups that had access to the desired raw materials. The sites are the places where the materials are processed and used, and in some cases they are entirely used up there. In other cases, they are reworked and then again introduced into distribution networks. This sequence entailing the procurement, use and distribution of lithic raw materials can be termed lithic resource management. The reconstruction of the processes involved in resource management presents us archaeologists with perfect opportunities to reconstruct intercultural relations, migration networks and contact between groups based on the ability to reconstruct the procurement. This is what we are mainly interested in here today, the first step of this sequence, because we cannot make any further interpretations if we cannot trace the materials back to the original sources. The first step in this process is the determination of the used materials. We have various uh, raw materials that can be used for chipped stone tool production, for instance, flint, radiolarite, chert, or also petrified wood. Mm -hmm. And there's standardized, well-established analytical methods for uh, determining their nature, so we don't have to go into further details here. Provenance studies, on the other hand, are entirely different uh, in nature. There's not the one method one can use to establish the origin of a lithic artifact. We always need to have a combination of methods, which in this case we term the multi-layered church sourcing approach combining macroscopic, microscopic, and geochemical analysis methods. Macroscopic grouping is intended to form homogeneous groups based on macroscopic uh, criteria, which have to be further investigated with the subsequent analytical steps. The second stage is microscopic analysis aiming at the reconstruction of the depositional environment of the investigated siliceous rocks, meaning the host rock fascias and the origin of silica mainly. There exists a wide range of depositional environments producing such materials, and I will present a few examples here, starting from the deep sea area with radiolarites, then going up to Reefs, this is already more shallow water, as we can see here in the Krakow Church, having remains of sea urchins, or in Krumlovs Kiles Church with the remains of marine sponges. Then we move up into the shallower water in the shelf environment with Nubolitic Church from the United uh, Arabian Emirates, and eventually out of the seawater into the lacustrine environments with Miocene Church from the Rhine Basin in present day Styria in Austria. A wide range of petrographic and geochemical methods has been employed for Chert and Flint provenance studies with varying success. The method we found most suitable for geochemical analysis of silicides is laser ablation ICPMS. We use the facilities available at the University of Graz for this method. And we need to keep a few basic facts in mind when dealing with SiO2 rocks. Basically, these are very pure substances with a typical concentration of trace elements ranging between 2 and 500 ppm altogether. Laser ablation ICPMS is a method for trace element analysis. It can be performed in a non-destructive manner. We can measure a wide range of elements simultaneously, which is a huge advantage over other 
methods and we have a very high resolution with approximately 0 0.1 ppm. The mounts to be used for this type of study can look as follows. We can do destructive analysis, chip little pieces off and place them into resin mounts like here on the left side with geological samples. For archaeological material, which is more sensitive and cannot be destroyed, we can also place pieces as a whole into the sample holder and then perform quasi non-destructive analysis. The resulting raw composition data have to be statistically treated. Uh, for this, we use compositional data analysis, in short, CODA. It means that the absolute measured values have to be transformed into a Euclidean geometry system where the standard operational statistic methods can work. We see how this works here in the two example plots that I provide. On the left side, we see a binary scatter plot with the raw compositional data. This example is uh, on radiolarites, Carpathian versus Northern Alpine uh, sources. And we see that in the elemental couple, the binary scatter plot, we get a basic separation, but it's not very good. Whereas when we see the coda plot, we have a consistent group building and our statistical results are way enhanced. How this works now uh, in archaeological studies, I will present in two cases. The first being Platua, Platia Magula Sarku in Thessaly, Greece. This tail site is a key for studying the Neolithic in Greece. The Neolithic occupation there lasted between 5800 and 5100 BC. We see the artifacts that we selected for our study here in, on this plate. These are mainly radiolarites. In order to reconstruct the uh, resource management and the sources that were potentially used by the prehistoric inhabitants of Platia Magula Saku. We conducted geoarchaeological surveys, and as we can see here on the geological map, the area which is most promising for chertz and radiolarites is the Kotsiakas mountain range to the west of the site, and this is why we concentrated mainly on this area with our investigations. We established a wide array of mainly secondary sources, as we can see here, as so river sources, which also provided a possibility to test our method in the course of these source conditions. We also include, included one primary source in the case of PMZ5 here in the lower left corner. Microscopic analysis of the archaeological artifacts established that most of the materials are radiolarites. But this is already as far as we can go, because as we know from previous studies, radiolarites do not allow much more um, in terms of provenance than to establish the material itself. So radiolarites are a little bit critical in this regard. The same is true for the geological samples. We see a pretty homogeneous picture, uh, despite the two last samples, M and N, they derive from uh, source which is which has different material and we included it to test possibilities to characterize and differentiate materials from the same source region but being different geological facies. Here are now our geochemical results already treated with compositional data analysis. The first finding here shows that PMZ4, the green signals, can well be separated from all the rest. This is the first thing. I marked the used sources for these studies in the same colors in the map so that we can correlate the plot and the geographical map. Let's now have a look at the results from the other three used, PMC8, which, which represents the Pineos River, PMC2, this is the Port Tychos, and PMC5 is a primary source just above the PMC2 Port Tychos River source. We can see that we achieve a differentiation, although there's an overlapping, but since these are secondary sources, this is not very surprising. What is interesting is that we can establish the catchment of PMC2 with PMC5, because this primary source, PMC5, feeds into PMC2. So we have, with this test, a geochemical catchment study and reconstruction of river secondary sources, which has very important implications for future studies with rivers. When we employ the 
geochemical results of our sources now to the artifacts, we see that most of the material is coming from PMC-8, as so the Pineos River. This is a little surprising because during our geoarchaeological surveys, we found better and more material in the Potecos, as I said, PMC-2. This must have cultural reasons. First, it could be that the inhabitants of Platia Magulasaku had closer relations to this area and were using the river more often. And this is also probably because of the fact that the Pineos is just a larger water course and can be shipped. The second case study is Scandinavian Flint provenance. This study has already been published in the PLOS ONE journal. The basic geological map of this area shows three main structural elements to which flint formation is linked. In the north, the Sorgenfrei Tornquist zone, in the center, the Danish Basin, and in the south, the Ringköbing Fünhai. We sampled uh, in a sourcing study practically every accessible primary source linked to the southern Scandinavian flint area to get a good overview over the outcrop situation. Our first question concerns the chronological separation between the two main elements, the Maastrichtian and the Danian cluster. In binary scatter plots, we see that the separation is roughly possible, however, it is not perfect, but we see an evolving trend, which is then completely achieved applying compositional data analysis. So we have an almost 100% possibility to separate the Danian versus the Maastrichtian sample clusters. This means for archeological artifacts that we are now able to assign a lithic tool that is made from Scandinavian flint with a very high security to one of these two source clusters. So we can say if it's Danian or Maastrichtian. But of course, we wanted to go a few steps further, and now we tested the possibilities of a separation within these clusters. Looking first at the Maastrichtian source cluster, we see that applying compositional data analysis again, we achieve a separation of three very clear cut source areas. The same is possible applying a compositional data analysis to the Danian source clusters. We have to keep in mind that. During this time, an uplifting of the sea bottom happened and the seawater was more obliterated. And in the end, we measure seawater chemistry that is um, introduced in the in form of the trace elements in the silicides, in the flint. And this is also represented here in this plot. However, we can still differentiate three main clusters. What we got? Out of this analysis is the reconstruction and separation of clear-cut depot centers. So not only are we able to assign lithic artifacts to either the Maastrichtian or the Danian cluster, we can now even go a step further and assign lithic artifacts to the northern, the two central or the southern depot center. And this is something which has never been achieved before. Now we wanted to, of course, apply these geological uh, findings to an archaeological case study. For this, we used ship ballast, which was found in a shipwreck from the 16th century, just off the shore of Norway, close to Kristiansand. And this is how it looks. This is a very homogeneous sample of Danian limestone blocks containing flint. And this flint we could extract and apply our analysis with it. Now plotting the geological uh, results together with the Christiansand ballast flint um, results, we see that most of the samples plot into the northernmost cluster. There are, of course, a few outliers, this is normal, but the majority can be assigned to the northernmost cluster of the Danian source region. And now correlating the results with our findings from the geoarchaeological surveys we conducted, we could establish a beach, a beach stretch at the Vixö Bay, which also is the only source presenting such an abundance of such limestone blocks containing Danian flint in the entire Danian area, one has to say, as a blind test with our Christian Sand shipwreck ballast. So also, the landscape reconstruction fits very well with our geochemical results.
Through these two case studies, we were able to show the potential of the MLA for prehistoric and also historical resource management. What are the main advantages now of this method? The first one is that we have a flexible combination of analytical techniques. Means if geochemistry, for instance, does not work uh, as the ultima ratio, we can always recite to, for instance, microfossil inclusions, which might work better. We have to bear in mind that sometimes only a source region can be established and not an individual source. This depends on the individual setting of the geological um, region where a case study is placed in. Most important here is that we employ a systematic approach. Sourcing studies are, of course, always only as good as the underlying database. We have presently approximately 5,000 datasets from over 50 sources worldwide, and we're constantly enlarging this atlas of sources, this collection, in order to securely reconstruct what I was presenting at the very beginning, prehistoric, prehistoric resource management, the procurement of lithic raw materials, and then being able to reliably trace lithic economy. I have selected literature for you if you're interested in further readings. So we have published these studies already. And you may also contact me uh, via, inter, uh, via email if you like and if you want further information. And with this, I thank you for watching and thank you very much for your attention.